what if we could actually use the same power of science to turn the clock back and figure out how to stop disease in the first place? So breast cancer, colon cancer, brain tumors, lung cancer, pancreatic cancer, diabetes, we've got chronic inflammation, and heart disease, chronic inflammation, cancer, chronic inflammation, and chronic inflammation triggers other diseases as well. It's Let's just dive right in. Why don't you share with my audience a little bit about your, your background? Yeah, well, I am a physician in internal medicine, and I'm also a research scientist. So I, I actually study a field called vascular biology, which relates to our circulation, about a 60,000 mile channel of networks that bring blood and oxygen to every cell in our body. Um, and I'm also an author. I wrote a, a New York Times bestseller called E to Beat Disease. Um, and, you know, I am really committed to bringing the new science and the new evidence for how food can be medicine and how to actually make that practical into everyone's lives. I love that. You're also the president of the Angiogenesis Foundation. That's right. Um, you know, about 25 years ago, a little bit longer, actually, um, I decided to create a nonprofit organization, um, a charity that's dedicated to trying to find ways to um, create scalable impact by looking for common denominators of disease. And the short story of my um, sort of like long lived foundation is um, I uh, started to realize as a medical doctor that we spend billions of dollars studying cancer. We study, spend billions of dollars studying heart disease. We start billions of dollars studying diabetes and we, we're not making progress fast enough. And in all the efforts that the medical, re the incredible efforts the medical research community is doing, what they do is try to figure out what makes each disease unique and different from all other diseases, right? And what I decided that maybe what was needed was to turn that world upside down a little bit. And rather than make, looking at what makes diseases different from one another, what do they share in common? What is the common denominator of disease? And so that's really what I set out um, to do with the Androgenesis Foundation. And it's been really remarkably successful as an approach. We've actually um, uh, helped to foster 41 FDA approved new breakthrough treatments for cancer, diabetes, and even vision loss. Wow. So the concept of leveraging a common denominator is quite powerful. That is incredible. So would you say that angiogenesis uh, is, the, is the common denominator there? Yeah. Well, so that's, that's the crazy thing is that, you know, like um, uh, I, I was lucky enough to study with a research scientist named Judah Folkman, who was the kind of the father, the pioneer of angiogenesis research. And angiogenesis, um, for your viewers and listeners, um, is a fancy Greek word that means something really sim simple. Angio, blood, genesis, growth. And it's about how our blood vessels actually grow. Mm -hmm. um, this is a, you know, 60,000 mile channel, as I mentioned, the highways and byways inside our body. Our blood vessels are so important that if you were to pull out every single blood vessel and line them up end to end, you would create a thread that would wrap around the earth twice. That's all packed inside our bodies. And so we got to keep a healthy circulation. And as you can imagine, when that system goes haywire, when it goes out of control, not enough blood vessels or too many blood vessels, you wind up having serious diseases, either organs or and tissues that starve because they don't have enough oxygen and nutrients, or you're feeding disease tissues. And that's really kind of the filter, I think, that was unique in at least my contribution to doing something disruptive and different in medicine is like just having a completely different lens to look at how to drive innovation. Now, that actually was a starting point for me to look at diet because I, I spent all this time developing breakthrough medicines. And I realized that when we're treating disease, even as innovative as the treatments could be, the reality is, is that we're, we're a little too late. You know, it's kind of like, um, you know, a, a dollar short and, you know, a day too late. What if we could actually use the same power of science to turn the clock back and figure out how to stop disease in the first place. And that's what led me to think about prevention. That's what led me to think about not drugs, but food, which is much better for prevention. And then I realized that, you know, what we need is really good evidence for dietary health. And a lot of that stuff that's out there floating in the ether, so to speak, about food and health is not all that anchored in science. And so, you know, over the last decade, I've really decided to take the harpoon and really try to nail the science.
Yeah, so let's get into that. Um, but before we do, what? So can you give us some examples of disease states that are associated with too much angiogenesis, the growth, you know, the unchecked growth of too many blood vessels, and maybe some disease states that are the result of not enough angiogenesis? Yeah. Well, listen, our circulation is one of the very first things that form our bodies when we're in the womb. So number one, it's sort of like there's a blueprint for all the blood vessels that need to form. That's how we know like in an anatomy text where the aorta is and all the blood vessels. And that's how surgeons know where to go and where not to go. And the body keeps that pattern in perfect, a perfect state of balance. You know, it's kind of like Leonardo drew that blueprint and it's going to be that way. And the body knows how to actually prune away extra blood vessels and grow new ones where they're needed. So we've got what I call the Goldilocks zone you know, like the three bears, not too hot, not too cold, but just right. We have just the right number of blood vessels, not too many and not too few. Now, here's the, here's the um, I think the, the eye-opening part, um, the light bulb in your head going off. So when your body is unable to prune away, mow the lawn and get rid of those extra blood vessels, what do you think they do? You know, your healthy tissues don't need them. So those extra, the overage, goes to feed disease cells. So what are some of the diseases? Breast cancer, colon cancer, brain tumors, lung cancer, pancreatic cancer. In fact, every single cancer, including blood cancers, are angiogenesis or blood vessel dependent. These blood vessels feed the cancer. And so now we've actually found ways to actually starve the cancer by cutting off the blood supply. Another disease with extra blood vessels is arthritis. The, the blood vessels that grow extra in our joints bring enzymes that destroy the joints. Psoriasis is another disease. And then actually, as, as people get older, you know, when we get into our 60s and 70s and older, and people are living longer these days, um, uh, uh, and sometimes living with chronic diseases, it turns out that a cause of vision loss for aging, macular degeneration, age-related macular degeneration, you know, you probably know someone, a parent, a, a relative, a, a parent of a friend. Um, that's the most common cause of blindness uh, in this country. And people who are under 60, diabetes is a common cause. And what is causing that blindness, vision loss? Blood vessels that are growing in the eye out of control that the body hasn't mowed down so that we have just the right amount. That overage, those vessels leak. And when blood leaks in your eye, game over. And so um, there are medicines that actually um, have been developed um, to really halt this in its tracks. Remarkably, in a small percentage of people, you can reverse lost vision. So you can actually put somebody who can't drive, you can put them back in the seat of a car, which is amazing. But again, what could we do with food using the same principles to prevent that or prevent cancer or prevent arthritis? And, and another exciting frontier that's extra blood vessels is Alzheimer's disease because even the guy, the German scientist who discovered Alzheimer's disease found abnormal blood vessels growing in the brains of people with, this, with dementia. And so what we now know is that you've got to kind of mow down and get rid of all those bad blood vessels to make room for new, fresh, good blood vessels to grow back. So, you know, this is an area of medical breakthroughs that are fueling new treatments and new hope for people. Um, and I'm involved with that, but I'm even more excited by the possibility of prevention and not just possibility, but the reality of being able to prevent these diseases with a healthy diet. Oh, well, I love that. And I love the concept of food as medicine, which I know you talk a lot about, uh, a lot about. Um, so let's, uh, let's dive in. You mentioned off the top that there are some misconceptions about how to eat healthily that, uh, you know, I, I detected a little bit of frustration um, in your tone. Let's, let's start there. What are some, what would you say are some misconceptions, the biggest myths that people have about food as it relates to our health? Yeah, you know, like, so I'm a scientist. And so the way that I navigate uh, my life is really by looking at the science, which builds on itself. And if you focus on facts, and you focus on new discoveries, um, it's easier for someone like me by focusing on the facts to sort of not get bogged down, distracted or confused by all the stuff that's flowing, floating out there that might not be anchored in, in facts or data. That said, 
you're, what you're asking is what are some of these common myths about food and health? Well, the first thing that I think uh, that's uh, a important myth to bust is that in order to eat healthy, you have to cut stuff out of your life, hmm. right? That's the thing that bums the people out the most. That's the thing that makes diets unsustainable because, you know, uh, human nature abhors deprivation. When somebody tells you, you can't do something, your brain automatically triggers this switch that says, well, you know, maybe just once <laughs> or maybe more, right? So I've, again, sort of tried to flip that uh, discussion around to say, could we actually um, add foods to our diet? What foods should we add? Because if we can focus on the foods that are supported by science that help us prevent disease and lower disease, ameliorate diseases, you know, help treat diseases, frankly, that's food is medicine. Um, uh, then we're actually doing something positive. So that's the first myth is you got to remove everything that you love. Um, I would tell you that the opposite is true. You can actually add food to your, that you love. And my motto, by the way, is love your food to love your health because that's what you want to line up. Those are the two sites that you want to line up when you're actually staring at your dinner plate. Um, so that's one big myth. And then there's a ton of these, you know, um, uh, uh, urban legends that are floating around about individual foods like tomatoes and soybeans and, you know, um, grapes and all kinds of stuff like that. And, and, you know, I'm happy to kind of tackle those, you know, it's kind of like, I'm in the, I'm in a batter's, uh, I'm, I'm having a, I'm, I'm standing in a, in a batter's box and you can throw them <laughs> at me and I can try to hit them out of the park for you. Yeah. It's like a game of whack-a-mole, right? Like every, every yeah. week, it seems like there's another new food that's being demonized by some tribe in the nutrition space online. Uh, tomatoes, you mentioned lectins, right? They contain lectins. And so there are some people that, that will say that tomatoes are the root cause and, 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 and foods, other lectin containing foods are the root cause of conditions like cardiovascular disease. Yeah. And, and here's, and here's where the science is. So lectins, um, are a natural substance that our body has. It's not just a bad guy in a plant. Um, our, our body's filled with lectins and lectins are not one kind of negative thing. There are hundreds and maybe thousands of lectins that are out there. Lectins actually are important as the glue that holds one thing together. So it's kind of the Elmer, part of the Elmer's glue that holds plants and people together. Um, and yes, absolutely. Some well-intentioned person identify the fact that there are some lectins that are actually very, very deadly and poisonous. Like if you eat them, you'll die. However, those are not the lectins in a tomato, you know, or, a, or a kidney bean. And, and so again, I think that what I'm trying to do as a scientist is bring clarity to the message. And so what I'm just telling you now is that yeah, you know, it is true. There are some lectins that are not so good for you, um, but actually they're not the ones that are in a tomato. And so I think this is sort of like a, uh, an over-interpretation, you know, good, well-intentioned people trying to do their best to connect the dots, but because lectins are so common, um, it's the wrong dots to connect. So tomatoes, if you want to really know the, the evidence, right? Like what's the human evidence? You got to look at clinical trials. And, and this is something that, you know, I'm uh, I'm really comfortable eating and breathing because when you're doing drug development and developing new breakthrough medicines, you have to do clinical trials. So I'm happy to talk about them. There's a study of 30,000 men um, studied over 20 years. It's called the Health Professional Follow-Up Study um, that looked at how many tomatoes that people ate uh, over a period of time. And it turns out that men who ate two to three servings of cooked tomatoes, how big is a serving? It's a half cup half a cup of tomato sauce or salsa, okay, um, uh, lowered the risk in this group of, of humans studied by um, almost 30%, 29% of prostate cancer, Wow! right? And for the people that wound up going on to develop prostate cancer, when they biopsied the tumor, so, you know, I'm getting into medical speak now, right? But we this is it. where we the evidence is. You biopsy the, the prostate cancer, you look at it under the microscope, and then you count the blood vessels because like uh, uh, tomatoes contain lycopene, lycopene cuts off the blood supply to tumors, kind of like that lawnmower that get, right size your circulation, prevents tumors from getting blood vessels. So that even the people who developed prostate cancer, because tumors require blood vessels to grow, guess what? The more tomato sauce that these men who developed prostate cancer ate, the fewer the blood vessels 
the less aggressive the cancer. And so this has now been borne out by uh, many different studies. And even for women, there's about a 20% lowering of the risk of breast cancer for the same reason. So um, lycopene is not the only thing in a tomato, but it is one of the things that has been scientifically studied. Do you know if that's true for all carotenoids? Because you mentioned that angiogenesis is involved in age-related macular degeneration. We know that mm. two carotenoids other than lycopene, uh, in the same category of phytochemicals, though, lutein and zeaxanthin are protective against age-related macular degener degeneration. Would you, I mean, could you speculate on, on that mechanism? Could it? I, I can, I can not only speculate, I can confirm, uh, what you're, uh, what you're asking about, which is that both lutein and zeaxanthin, which are, uh, along with lycopene in the carotenoid family, you know, they, they all together, they are what makes carrots, orange and reddish and bell peppers. And, you know, many reddish colored um, foods are, are, you know, uh, orange and red hued colored foods. Um, they are all angiogenesis inhibitors. They all mow the lawn and kind of trim down um, the X, the overage of blood vessels. So exactly to your point, that's one of the reasons, uh, one of the explanations for why they actually prevent age-related macular degeneration, prevent those extra blood vessels from growing and leaking. And I, I was actually on a panel uh, called the Global Ophthalmology Awards Program. So we're working with, you know, probably, you know, a dozen of the world's best eye specialists. And we, we discuss this topic often, um, how, you know, the um, ARIDS2 supplements that contain both of these supplements both of these carotenoids actually can be useful, but it's not just the supplement. You can also get these same carotenoids from the food that you eat. Yeah, it's, uh, it's actually quite amazing. I'm a huge fan of, uh, of carotenoids in general. Um, so I guess, you know, the, give us the overarching sort of your overarching dietary philosophy. Um, you know, what, what are the kinds of things that we should be looking for when pushing our shopping carts through the supermarket? What are the kinds of, you know, you could take it at the level of, of food category or individual foods that, that really excite you. Um, and what are the kinds of foods that we should be steering clear from? If sure. we want to keep angiogenesis within a nice, healthy range in our bodies. Yeah. We spent time talking about angiogenesis, but let me kind of back up for one second before I go into, you know, kind of hyperspeed to kind of tell, you know, to share with you, um, how I think about shopping in a grocery store, for example, and what to choose and what to stay away from. Um, first of all, when it comes to food and health, it's not just about the food. It's about how our body responds to what you put inside it. That's how, you know, doctors think about drugs, you know, whatever you put into your body, yeah, um, uh, it's got to have an effect in the body. And so, um, you know, out there, you hear all the marketing about this superfood or this super supplement. I can tell you there's no such thing as a single superfood or super supplement. If you want to call it something super, it's the human body. It's pretty awesome and amazing of what it can do and what it can do best, better than anything else. And what we inherited when we kind of emerged from our mom's womb is the ability to resist disease. It is a result of your body's hardwired health defense systems that we were born with. From the day we're born to our very last breath, We've got at least five health defense systems that are right about in my book, ETP disease. Angiogenesis, our circulation is one of our health defense systems. Good circulation, good health. Um, out of control circulation, cancer, macular degeneration, et cetera, et cetera. Second health defense system is our stem cells that are in our bone marrow that can come flying out um, to regenerate our organs slowly every single day. We're actually repairing and replacing ourselves, regenerating not like a salamander or a starfish, like we can't grow back an arm or a leg, not yet. But one of the things that we can do is we can replenish aging and kind of like um, uh, slightly kind of worn out um, organs. And, um, and in the same way that foods can actually um, cut off extra blood vessels and grow good ones, um, uh, there are certain foods that can actually help prompt and recruit stem cells into the circulation um, to be able to help accelerate our regenerative properties. Like foods that can cause regeneration is quite an amazing concept. Our microbiomes, our third um, health defense system, our healthy gut bacteria, a lot of people talk about the microbiome and it's a, one of the pillars, five pillars of my concept uh, that I talk about in terms of healthy food uh, because the foods that we eat can either 
harm our microbiome, our gut bacteria, which then harms our immune system, harms our brain neurotransmitter system, um, harms our ability to heal. Okay, our bacteria really control a lot of these, influence a lot of these healthy systems. Um, uh, and if you feed the bacteria with things that they like, you nourish, nurture your bacteria, like you'd feed your dog or your cat or your bird, and you treat them well, your bacteria um, become really vibrant and they actually help our brain and our immune system and lower inflammation to help our metabolism. Fourth one's our DNA, uh, fourth health defense system, which um, we think it's, you know, everybody thinks of genetic code as DNA. Turns out our DNA protects us against the environment in ways that we hadn't even thought about. For example, you're pumping gas. If you still drive a gas car, um, I, I always ask people, do you stand upwind or downwind of the pump? And people look at me and say, well, why are you even asking that question? And I say, if you can smell the fumes of the gasoline, you are standing downwind. And those solvent vapors in your lungs are causing DNA mutations. Mm. Why don't you get lung cancer right away or the next day? Because your body's DNA is protecting your health by fixing itself when it's damaged. You're out there in traffic, you know, um, uh, uh, with a window down on a sunny day in the summertime, you know, like uh, you're not lying out on the beach, you know, you're not in the sun tanning booth, but you are getting that sun on your arm. That's causing DNA damage on your skin. So how do you, how come you don't get skin cancer only in your left arm when you're, when your arm's out the window? Because it, the DNA is being fixed. So foods, you can eat foods including carotenoids, it can help speed up your DNA being fixing itself. And so that's really, when you ask about what's my framework, my concept, it's not only about the food, it's about how your body responds to it. So there's no single food. In fact, I write about more than two, 200 foods that you can easily find in the grocery store. Most of them in the perimeter of the grocery store in the fruits and you know, plant-based section, um, but also in the seafood section for those people who actually still eat seafood. Um, um, and although we were told to avoid the middle aisle, it turns out that there's a lot of really good things in the middle aisle. Beans, um, whether they're dried or canned. Tree nuts, um, uh, uh, really great for the microbiome. It's got good healthy fats. Olive oil, right? There's certain olive oils, three varietals, monovarietals from Italy, Spain, and Greece. I can tell you what they are. The Cornecchi, the Moriolo, and Picuo olives. If you can get monovarietal olive oils, they have the highest levels of cancer starving anti-androgenic polyphenols. So I have a great time going into the middle aisle. I'm very selective. I ignore all that ultra processed stuff and the candy bars and the you know weird colored chips, but I, I know what I'm going for. And so really my whole philosophy is um, uh, know what you like, what you love to eat, know where it's located in the grocery store, when you get in that store, make a beeline for it, you know, kind of ignore all the marketing stuff, you know, go for the carrots if you like the carotenoids or the red bell peppers or the kale um, or, you know, um, the radicchio. Like I, I love that kind of stuff. Um, and then, you know, if you're going to go into the middle aisle, get make sure you've got some good, healthy oils. You've got some nuts and beans and all those kinds of things that are good for you. Spices, dried spices, also good for you. I love that. It sounds like the dietary pattern uh, that you recommend is, is pescatarian is like a sort of Mediterranean pescatarian hybrid. Would that be an accurate statement? You know, my, my approach is, um, uh, uh, my approach is really flexible. So if you're pescatarian, it, it, it works. If you're vegetarian, it works. If you're a vegan, it works. And, and if you are somebody who is an omnivore and you eat pretty much everything, what I tell you is that if you spend most of your time eating foods that actually build up your health defense systems, you know, the stuff that's not so good for you that you should ignore. So what are those? Um, eating a lot of red meat, um, which you should cut down or cut out. Um, eating uh, ultra processed foods, um, taking in um, sugar sweetened beverages, uh, and also eating artificial sweeteners. Those things are definitely not good for your health defenses. Like the research has shown, they take down and damage angiogenesis, stem cells, microbiome, impair your DNA, and they take down your immunity as well. So there are clearly things that actually are not so good for you to eat, not so much because they're intrinsically evil, but when you put them in your body, your body doesn't respond well to them. Hmm. What is... So what would you say is the, um, is the primary problem, or maybe, maybe there are more than one with red meat? Is it the, you know, is it the saturated fats? Uh, yeah, you know, so it's a, it's a great question. Um, everybody tries to pin things on saturated fats and there's a controversy now about saturated fats. 
you know, some people say they're not necessarily as bad as they're not, you don't want to demonize them. Um, they play their role as well. Um, I think that part of the issue about a heavy meat diet is really the overage of eating meat and the way, by the way, that meat is treated um, in factory farming. Uh, also doesn't actually help the quality of the meat, the antibiotic laced foods, meats, uh, the way they're treated. And because some animals are actually fattened up in with steroids and other, you know, artificial things, you're, you're not really getting a pure food, you're getting a doctored food uh, in a way that's not so good for you. We do know, by the way, that eating preserved meats, which I, which I didn't put on my list, but not just red meat, but preserved meats, you know, the, the, the deli meats, the things that you, you know, we probably all grew up with, you know, like uh, as kids, you know, you get a piece of bologna, you put it between two pieces of white bread and <laughs> put some, you know, artificial mayonnaise on like, I mean, everybody has had that experience, right? At least in this country, that kind of experience. And we know that um, artificial processed meats are actually rated by the World Health Organization as a carcinogen. And all the data shows that people who eat way a lot of uh, processed meats. Uh, uh, I'm not talking about the naturally processed meats, you know, like the salamis and things hanging in the air in Italy or Sardinia. I'm talking about the mass produced stuff that you get at the grocery store. You know, that's not good for you. And so I think that um, let's focus, this is what I tell people, let's focus on the things that you love that are good for you. Yeah. Let's find I ways to make them as tasty as possible. I love that you qualified that because, I mean, honestly, when I see, you know, when I read the statement from the World Health Organization, I'm thinking to myself, yeah, it's the bologna that people are eating, you know, in between the two slices of white bread with the mayo, with the soda, with the bag of sun chips on the side. You know, it's like, it's that. It's the milieu. Exactly. It's not. Exactly. You know, and, the, and I'm not saying that that meat is good for you either, but it's, uh, it would yeah, be impossible and, and that in my view. Well, it's just like the lectin story or, yeah. you know, like it's so easy to try to find a culprit and then paint them as most wanted and then send a vigilante team to go hunt them down. Like it's, it's not that simple. Yeah, I agree. Um, if you are opting to, because you're absolutely right about the factory farm system. If you do uh, incorporate meat into your diet, red meat specifically, uh, what, what do you look out for? You know, I try to get... Um, uh, what I call kind of conscientiously raised uh, meats. Mm -hmm. um, I care about the planet and I care about animals. And so I think that if you're going to go for meat, uh, get meat that's done properly, raised properly. Right. And, you know, and, and just a little side comment uh, that I, you know, usually I, I don't try to tell people what not to do. I try to encourage people what to do that they enjoy. Right. But I will tell you, um, I, I scratch my head a little bit about these plant-based burgers that are genetically engineered and, um, uh, and you know, they're, they're ultra processed a lot of times. And it's like, look, man, if you really love a burger, you know, and you, and you got to eat a burger and that's what you really love, take good care of your body, eat really good stuff that supports your health defense systems most of the time. And then if you're going to eat a burger, get the best friggin' burger you can find with the best quality of meat and just go for it. Knock yourself out. Just don't do it all the time. I love that. You talk about foods that can help us regenerate our tissues, our organs, um, with the help of stem cells that we produce endogenously. What are some of those regenerative foods? Yeah. So um, first of all, just so that everyone knows how we know that our bodies regenerate, we have stem cells that actually live in our bone marrow. They're kind of like bees living inside a hive. And when, uh, when our um, organs or tissues need to be repaired or regenerated, they send a signal to our bone marrow. The bone marrow is kind of like the brown stuff that you break a chicken bone and you can see in the middle of it. That's all, um, that's all those are all stem cells. Uh, we actually were made from stem cells in the womb. Um, the leftovers are just packed into our bone marrow and a few other places. Um, and and uh, when there's a signal that your organ needs to be repaired, basically the damaged area sends a text message to your bone marrow and says, hey, I need a few stem cells, come on. And what happens is that that message will send out the stem cells into your bloodstream and your genesis like bees coming out of a hive. And those bees go, they make a beeline literally right for that organ and repair it, replace it. It's pretty amazing. Uh, if I, you know, a lot of people don't know this, but if you had your liver, so some of our organs really regenerate. Uh, if you had a liver problem, and uh, I remove two thirds of your liver, most of it, the rest of it, a third will grow right back, the rest of it right back. 
If I clipped off the top of your lung, it would just regenerate, grow right back. And, and, and like, you know, people go, whoa, I, I didn't know that. But guess what? Our hair grows back. Our skin grows back. You know, you got a little dandruff on. It's because your, your skin's falling off the old stuff, being replaced by stem cells. So um, what are the foods that can actually help augment, boost, activate, you know, amplify this process? Well, um, there's a whole bunch of them. One of my favorite ones is to talk about is dark chocolate, cacao, uh, which is a fruit pod, um, uh, actually, and, and dried and, and uh, uh, usually fermented. Um, cacao has all these polyphenols. And some of the cacao polyphenols, which are called proanthocyanidins, actually have been shown when they're, when they're given in dark chocolate, like really dark, high flavanol cocoa, okay? Um, specifically, the study was done with hot chocolate made with ultra dark chocolate, um, high flavanol co cacao. Um, uh, you give it, there, there was a study in people who are old, older, 60s, with heart disease, okay? They had bad circulation, bad hearts. And, uh, and um, they gave them just two cups of hot cocoa to have a day for 30 days. At baseline, they measured their stem cells in the bloodstream. So we can actually withdraw a blood, like you go to a doctor's office, and we can count the stem cells um, in your bloodstream under a microscope. Okay, so we know one, two, three, four, five. We know exactly what you started out with baseline. Everyone with heart disease starts out with fewer uh, stem cells. That's probably why you, in part, why you have the heart disease. You're not repairing yourself fast enough. Uh, 30 days of having two cups a day of hot cocoa with high flavanols, like dark chocolate, it doubled the number of stem cells in your bloodstream. And when you actually measure the blood flow using a blood pressure cuff and an ultrasound, it doubled the improvement. It basically um, uh, improved your blood flow as well. So again, powerful stuff and, and nailed right down to the stem cells. Barley can also do it. And there's also even a, a, a substance in a fruit peel called ursolic acid. Um, ursolic acid uh, is found in the peel of um, apples and peaches and um, uh, uh, cranberries. Um, uh, and it's really hard to eat or apricots, really hard to eat a lot of fruit skin, like doesn't sound that appetizing. But if you get dried fruit, I don't know if I would regularly eat six whole apricots, but I could easily eat six dried apricots a day. Okay. So lots of easy ways of actually getting fruit peel or solic acid that also helps to regenerate um, your organs. Is it not true that some of the most polyphenol rich uh, foods in the supermarket are, we know that they're of course produce, but that they're bitter. They tend to be bitter uh, or sour, um, you know, herbs, spices, uh, dark chocolate, coffee, tea, wine, you know, really sort of, um, because these compounds, correct me if I'm wrong, they're generated as plant defense compounds, which are not toxic to us in the doses exactly. that they appear in our, uh, in our diets, but their tastes generally are meant to ward off smaller organisms. Yeah. But the plants, mother nature put these bioactive chemicals, okay, which is what all these things are, carotenoids and polyphenols, um, they, 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 Mother Nature um, kind of um, put them into the plant to protect the plant. The plant protects itself, and it's a little bitter, or a little sour, or a little, you know, floral, or whatever it is, um, because insects don't like that that scent, right? Um, and and so um, uh, when and so it's actually like natural insecticide. Um, uh, and so when humans started to eat plant based foods those natural plant defenses suddenly had a new job description. Mm -hmm. They had to interact with our human cells. And I think that's where over evolution, over th tens of thousands of years, we intuitively started to figure out which foods are actually better for us. And so we are not the only generation <clears throat> that has um, talked about how good plant-based foods are. I mean, this goes back, you know, probably back to the troglodytes, you know, they, they understood um, how, how important it was to eat, you know, um, fiber rich plant-based foods. Um, I think we're rediscovering at a much deeper level and understanding with science why it's so important. So do people who advocate for the carnivore diet just make you cringe? Like what, what's, what's your take on that? No, you know what, listen, I, I have a, <clears throat> I take the long view towards things. Um, First of all, I regard food as something that's very intimate. It's one of the most intimate parts of our lives. Why? Because when we, when you think about food, everyone has some association with 
the smells and the tastes of what they in the house you grew up in, what your mom cooked, right? Uh, your relatives, your your holidays, um, and it tells us something about our communities and our culture. And you know, in this country, we all came from someplace, and so there's everybody has their own you know unique um, influences. And I think that's wonderful because in every culture um, that you can get food in, there are elements, there are ingredients that are actually been shown to be plant based, and healthy. Sometimes it's seafood based, and not just fish, but even shellfish, you know, you can pick your way through more than 200 different ingredients that are um, good for you. Um, look, most people uh, before uh, the, the middle of the last century, before the middle 20th century, were not eating a lot of meat. They didn't have the money. The meat wasn't uh, scaled up to the factory farming. Um, uh, you know, it wasn't that easy to get access. Transportation wasn't that great. And so people were naturally uh, had more abundance of plant-based foods and seafood if you live near the shore. And it was much harder to get meat. And if you go to other countries, like certain places in Asia or certain places in Latin America uh, and, and many places in Europe, you know, the, the natural agrarian tendencies of communities is, is easier to get grow and easier to get plants. Um, uh, and, and I think what's happened is that we've lost this connection with our, our planet, frankly. And, and so, you know, uh, you just wheel your thing into the meat section of the grocery store. You can start, you know, like just putting car packages, uh, shrink wrap plastic packages into your into your grocery and and freeze it. That's not how we used to live. And so I think what we're just kind of getting back to common sense is, you know, like okay, you know, like some people think meat tastes really good. Some people really crave it. But honestly, the body of evidence, science evidence, but also kind of the tradition of humanity. We, we, we usually ate mostly plant-based foods and for people along the shore, adding a lot of seafood, that's all better for you. Um, let's get back to basics. And I think that's what we need to do is strip ourselves down a little bit away from the industrialization and, and, and think about our own bodies. Yeah, I love that. I definitely, I love plants and I love not plants. <laughs> I love both. So, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm definitely right there with you. Um, you mentioned the microbiome briefly. Uh, which we haven't really talked about in quite some time on the podcast. Do you want to, uh, for listeners that are maybe unfamiliar with the concept of the microbiome, uh, the gut microbiome specifically, go into that a little bit. And then uh, I guess, yeah, let's talk about how to nurture, nurture that aspect of our health. Yeah, such an important topic because our microbiome, our gut bacteria, which I'll explain in, in, in a second, really um, helps to influence, lowers inflammation in our body, helps to boost our healthy, protective immune system, and, and also powerfully influences our metabolism, how well we use glucose in our body and our insulin sensitivity. And also um, amazingly triggers signals through one of the big nerves in our body, the vagus nerve into our brain and influences neurotransmitters, which actually influences our mood. So here's the microbiome. Microbiome is our gut bacteria. And when I went to medical school many years ago, we were frankly taught that um, bacteria are bad, kill bacteria, must kill bacteria, right? And that's where everybody learns how to bust out their prescription bed and write antibiotics. Well, you know, it turns out that um, our gut has um, most of the bacteria in our body and most of our gut bacteria is healthy bacteria, good bacteria. In fact, we've got about 40 trillion cells, human cells in our body. You know, the cells that make up our heart and our brain, and our lungs and our face and everything else. We've got 39 trillion bacteria. Okay, wow. so almost a one to one. We're about half bacteria and half human. There's even a term, Max, for this, <clears throat> for an organism that's composed of multiple organisms, an ecosystem that's composed of multiple um, uh, organisms is called a holobiont, H O L O B I O N T. Doesn't sound as cool as being a cyborg, which is part <laughs> machine and part human, but part bacteria and part other organism, part human, we're holobionts. We're not even fully human anymore, right? So if our gut bacteria protect us, okay, and there's lots of different kinds. Um, recently, um, there's been some discoveries that there are tens of thousands of new viruses discovered in our gut that are not dangerous viruses like the one that causes COVID, you know, or HIV, but healthy viruses that actually keep bad bacteria from overgrowing. So, you know, we don't even want to get rid of all the viruses. We coexist with all these really important organisms in our body. And we've got to, um, and what are these, by the way, in, in health, what do they do? When we feed our gut bacteria, 
when we feed ourselves, um, our human cells absorb the nutrients, the vitamins, the minerals, all the things that we need. And then again, when I was in medical school, we were taught, you know, like fibrous foods, our body doesn't absorb them. It just passes it down to the colon. And because they kind of irritate the colon, it keeps you moving regularly. You go regularly, so to speak. The whole prune juice uh, uh, thing. It turns out that's not quite true. After we get fed first, okay, that leftover stuff that our human cells don't absorb goes to feed the bacteria. And so every meal we have, we're feeding our human cells and our bacterial cells. And again, very important, when we feed our bacteria good things, they thrive. And when they thrive, what do they do? They actually produce metabolites, their own metabolites. They're called short chain fatty acids or SCAFAs. You know, there's a lot of science to this, but the most important thing is that when we feed our gut bacteria well, they have their own metabolism. And what they kick out as part of their metabolism are these little fatty acids that are healthy. What do the healthy fatty acids do? They're released from the gut. They go into our bloodstream. They lower body inflammation. They help our, our own muscles and cells use glucose more effectively. They effectively help to prevent diabetes. Um, they um, maintain our blood pressure. Uh, and uh, again, oh, they speed up wound healing. They even keep our hair and our skin um, in good, healthy shape. Uh, and they can stimulate neurotransmitters like GABA, serotonin, oxytocin. Oxytocin, by the way, is a social hormone. When you've been isolated and in quarantine and finally get to see your friends and family again, you know, like you just have this rush. That rush is your brain producing oxytocin. It's the same hormone. By the way, when you get a good kiss, uh, your brain releases oxytocin. When you see somebody you love, same thing. Uh, the brain also has this massive uh, surge of oxytocin during orgasm. Okay, that's how important this is. Our gut bacteria helps to control that. So when we do good by our gut bacteria, they good do good by us and they help us to relieve our stress as well. So dysbiosis, which is a problem with our gut bacteria, undoes all those things, raises inflammation, which is the opposite, lowers our protective immunity, which is not what we want mucks around and screws up our metabolism. So our glucose goes up, you know, heading towards that diabetic state, um, uh, our, our healing, our ability to heal wounds goes down. Our skin doesn't look good. Our hair doesn't look good. And our brain neurotransmitters aren't, aren't functioning. And that's why dysbiosis, problems with the microbiome um, that can be easily fixed with food, okay, are, th are, are associated with depression, schizophrenia, and even autism. That is fascinating. So when it comes to feeding the microbiome, uh, is it as simple as just eating more fiber? Um, or are there certain kinds of fibers or a certain array of fibers, or are there certain phytochemicals that we want to yeah. uh, look for, non-fiber so, phytochemicals? No, it's a great question. So <clears throat> I'm the first person that uh, always at the party to tell people <clears throat> when there's a conversation about microbiome um, I, that you know, I'm going to put my uh, my honest scientist hat on because everybody's talking about the microbiome. Like it's a done deal. We know exactly what to do and we can do precision nutrition by measuring your stool. <clears throat> As a scientist, I can tell you, we are just scratching the tip of the iceberg of this new entire field that we barely understand how important the gut bacteria actually is. But what we have discovered is it's incredibly important. So, and, and what are some ways that we know already that we can actually do good by the food that we eat for our bacteria. Well, we can actually do prebiotics, which is fiber. Soluble fiber is really good. So what's a great, great source of soluble fiber? Mushrooms, you know, uh, most people don't realize it, but, but mushrooms have great soluble fiber. It's called beta D glucan. And it's present in the, the caps of the mushroom. You buy some white button mushrooms at the grocery store. Most people cut off the stems and then the caps, but guess what? sustainability is really important. Mother, Mother nature is really resourceful. So she put, guess what? Twice the amount of beta glucans in the mushroom stem as in the caps. So don't throw away the mushroom stem. Eat that <laughs> too. Find a way to do it. You don't like the way it looks, put it into a blender, make it into soup. Okay. Um, it's a great way to actually um, uh, uh, change it with mushrooms. Um, other types of fiber, like, um, like tree nuts have great fiber for your microbiome. Um, so when you eat a walnut, all those got some healthy fats, those, those um, fibers actually go right down to feed your gut. Here's how powerful the gut responds to good fiber is that it boosts your immune system and your immune system not only prevents invaders from the outside, like bacteria and viruses from tackling us, 
but they also prevent invaders from the inside. So what's a good, what's a, what am I talking about? I'm talking about cancer. Cancer is an invader from the inside that our immune system consistently um, conducts surveillance to try to figure out like, is there a bad guy there? Should I be taking it out? It's like our internal SWAT team, you know, trying to, as snipers, like trying to take out the bad guys if they find a cancer. Well, there's an amazing study of 700 people with stage three colon cancer. It's pretty advanced. And this is coming from the big universities from the East Coast and the West Coast uh, and, and, the, and the Southeast. And they found that in people with stage three colon cancer, um, getting treatment. So this is not about some magic food instead of for, like getting real treatment with an oncologist that those people who ate two handful of tree nuts, walnuts, pecans, macadamias, um, you know, pine nuts, whatever, um, they actually had a 50% decrease in mortality. That's huge. You can't get that with a drug or a pill, but, but just by modulating your microbiome, you can actually completely change things. Now that's one way is feeding the fiber. Another way to uh, treat um, is to treat your gut bacteria well. Is that you can uh, uh, there's a, there are certain bacteria that love to uh, grow in mucus. So you know we've got mucus in our mouth. We've also got mucus in our colons. Okay, and some bacteria. There's one particular bacteria called Ackermansia mucinophila. The mucinophila gives it away. It loves to live in mucus. Um, and Ackermansia is a I think that's a bacteria that we're going to start to hear over and over and over again over the next couple of decades. This is a guardian bacteria that helps our body lower the risk of cancer. So um, a study by a colleague of mine, Dr. Laurence Zitvogel in France, looked at 200 people with cancer being treated with immune therapies. This is like the really space age therapies, tip of the spear that actually don't kill the cancers directly, but wake up our immune system. So our immune system can go after the cancer. Now, here's the thing about immunotherapies. And, and again, I'm one of these doctors that can talk on both sides of the, of the aisle in terms of both the medicines, as well as the diet. Turns out that only works well in about 20% of people. Hmm. So 80% of people, most people don't get the response you want. And so the, the Laurent Zippogel basically said, let's line up everybody, 200 people. And let's figure out what makes the difference between a responder and a non-responder. And she looked at everything, genetics and weight and sex and everything else. Only one difference between the responders and the non-responders is the microbiome. And of the microbiome differences, the responders had one bacteria, Ackermansia, that the non-responders did not have. Now, if you had a cold and you got by a, a Z-Pack to treat your bronchitis, for example, that'll wipe out your Ackermansia for a little while. Hmm. So, um, uh, uh, so you can grow back. And so what she did is she found if you grew back the acromancia in the lab um, and you treated um, uh, tumors with the immunotherapy, you could take a non-responder and convert it into a responder. And so what are some ways of growing acromancia? Because you can't eat that as a probiotic yet. You can actually um, uh, get more mucus to your, your gut to secrete more mucus. What's a good way to do that? Turns out that the elagitannins, a bioactive present in pomegranates, present in cranberries, and present in conquered grapes. They uh, actually um, just kind of tickle your, um, your gut to secrete more mucus. You can, I had a patient once who um, had a blood cancer and she was going to get this immunotherapy, but she had just had a bronchitis. And, and, and I told her, I said, look, check your acromancia. So we, we checked her stool, zero, hmm. Z. Now we know from this research that Laurent Zifical did that that stacks the odds against you. So I said, before we start it, let's go ahead and get you on some pomegranate juice. Just eight ounces will do it. And then we um, measured her after three weeks and she had three times above the normal population of acromancia, great mucus. And then she got this immunotherapy and became like the, one of the best responders ever seen in this medical center and, and is alive and doing well today. So that's how powerful the microbiome can be. Another way of nurturing is actually having the mucus secreted. And then of course there's the probiotics, which is just eating the bacteria and you can get probiotic pills. I think the jury's out on which one's the best one and how well they work. But if you can have fermented foods, you're eating a lot of natural, healthy bacteria, yogurt, kimchi, um, uh, sauerkraut. Recently, I, I, I was um, at a farmer stand and I, I was in Dutch, uh, Pennsylvania, Dutch country, um, going to the farmer stands. And I'm like, wow, some homemade uh, sauerkraut. So I bought it and I, I, I ate some and it, man, it was just absolutely delicious. I don't like the, you know, the big factory produced versions. They just don't sit well with me, but this homemade stuff was really, really great. So fermented food is another way of actually doing it. 
Yeah, I mean the 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 big commercial uh, brand stuff usually doesn't have any don't have any probiotics in in them anyway. They're made to be shelf stable. Exactly. Uh, unfortunately, in my fridge right now, I've got natto, which is a uh, ah. fermented soybean. Are you a fan of natto? Uh, you know what? I I actually like natto. Um, it's really strong tasting, uh, and even among the Japanese, that you know, when natto comes from Japan, it's you know, if you if you think about like edamame, right? So the edamame you get in a Japanese restaurant, that's basically just a steamed soybean pod. And you pop those little green babies in your mouth and they're pretty bland. And then you kind of go um, up the, and then you squeeze them out and you get the soy milk. Um, and then you can up your game and you can make tofu. And once you start fermenting the tofu, the flavors get stronger, which is actually a delicacy in Asia. And then probably the, 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 the King Kong of, of uh, fermented um, soybean is, is natto. So I'm all for that. It's a great source of natural fermented food. Yeah. It's not the most user-friendly though. It, uh, <laughs> the, the, the texture is sort of like baked beans covered in some kind of lubricant. And uh, the flavor has been described as uh, being a combination between dirty socks and sweaty underwear. So it's not the most, I know that I know that I'm not selling it, but I find that with the addition of a little bit of tamari sauce, which is fermented, another type of fermented soy, uh, it actually, believe it or not, it becomes quite palatable. And we know that natto is a wonderful source of vitamin K2. Uh, natto kinase, which is this uh, really interesting enzyme that's drawn a lot of attention in the uh, sort of anti-aging literature, uh, and spermidine, which is another, it's sort of like a three for one deal if you could just get past the weird texture and taste. And vitamin K2, which is also called menaquinone, many people don't realize is a powerful anti-angiogenic cancer starving, mow down those extra blood vessels, um, a substance that actually been shown, the higher the level of your vitamin K2, the lower the risk of some cancers. So uh, again, another reason, you know, to um, love natto, uh, you know, one, one of the things that I tell people is, you know, there's so many great foods out there that contain healthy bioactives that are good for you. Um, explore. So what I encourage people to do is to, um, you know, uh, identify you know, like when I, I tell people who have, you know, bring me my book, you know, for, for me to sign, I'm like, you know, like, look, do me a big favor. I'm happy to sign your book. Uh, I want you to go to the tables of foods there. There's more than 200 foods. And, 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 you know, and I sometimes will give them a pen. And so here's what I want you to do. This is the best thing I can do for you. Circle the foods in your book that you already love. If it's a tomato circle, if it's a night plant, whatever it is, circle that. And I said, now, you know, the foods that you already love that are good for you start with those and you're already way ahead of the game. And if you want to explore something that you're not so certain of, like a natto, for example, um, in this day and age, it's so easy. Go to the internet, look up natto recipe, uh, natto uh, 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 dish cooking, and see how other people make it tasty. And that way you're, you're and it's like that food network thing, you know, like people get absorbed and they, they learn how to dare themselves to try something new. Yeah, it's so true. Although the, the the traditional natto recipe, correct me if I'm wrong, is eating it over white rice with a cracked raw egg on top of it, which to me it sounds less appetizing than natto itself with just a little bit of soy sauce. That's it. So that so you said the magic word, which is the traditional way. So I think that you know we're here we are in 2021, and with this you know this incredible array of creativity when it comes to cuisine. Right. So you don't have to be, you know, like a whatever, a cordon bleu trained chef. I think some people on the web are trying to show, demonstrate ways of making foods as tasty as possible. And that's part of the adventure, I think, uh, that I encourage people to take on a food like identify what you already love, uh, dig deeper into it, lean into the stuff that you already love, <clears throat> keep going, um, eat a lot of that stuff that you already love that's good for you. And then don't be afraid, dare yourself to try something new and to, and to get yourself into the right mindset and to get some ideas, see how other people do it, you know, watch a video. Um, if you're at a restaurant, give it a, give it a shot. If you have a friend, ask them, you know, how to, how to cook it. And, you know, the, the, it's not necessarily going to be like, I'm, I'm telling you what I'm going to do after we do this taping, I'm actually going to go and, and look for natto, modern day natto recipes that go beyond putting on a rice with a raw egg. I'm sure there's something that is going to make me interested in giving it a shot. Yeah. I, I mean, look, I love natto. I just want to clarify something. So you talk about anti-angiogenic foods, but angiogenesis is not 
inherently bad, right? So when you talk about foods that are anti angiogenic, are they able to be selective somehow to yeah. the it's you know, it's yeah, so absolutely. Obviously, so obviously our, we don't want we don't want angiogenesis to occur local to a tumor site, right? But we do want it to occur when it's, you know, occurring maybe um in our brains and we're healthy, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So the first thing to know is that there are foods that can cut off that extra blood vessels, the overage, mow the lawn, get it in good shape. <clears throat> and then there are foods that can actually grow blood vessels where you need them. So you can stimulate blood vessel growth um, uh, 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 that can actually be helpful as well. So there's both sides of the equation. Uh, uh, the body actually knows how to titrate the amount of blood vessels in the right place at the right time. So, um, so think about this not as a single number, but a range of numbers. And our body keeps score. You have enough blood vessels here, cool. Oh, wait a minute, you got a little bit extra blood vessels. I will naturally mow that those extras down. But if we eat foods that can actually help us, our body do that, we're protecting ourselves even more. And what's interesting is that you can't, although there are medicines that I could prescribe for you that would, cut down your angiogenesis, like override your body's own titration. As it turns out, foods can't, aren't that powerful. Foods can actually only get you just to that right level. So you never have to worry about eating a food that would prevent your healthy organs from getting a blood flow. And you never have to worry about eating foods that will grow blood vessels that will spark off a tumor. Yeah. The body just kind of handles it elegantly handles it. on its own. Yep. That's, Part of the mysteries of mother nature that we can only, you know, uh, thank evolution for getting it right. That, yeah, that is amazing. In terms of a dietary pattern that, you know, keeps those, those tumors from growing in the first place. Um, you know, well, what are your thoughts on, 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 on sort of that? I mean, is it just that eating a, a healthful diet, rich in phytonutrients, fiber, all checking all of the five boxes that you laid out for us earlier, um, is that going to basically, uh, is that the insurance that your body that, you know, that these tumors cell, uh, tumors are not going to grow to begin with? You, you know, um, I follow the evidence. And so basically, um, the evidence is pretty overwhelming that if you drink green tea regularly, even a single cup, but ideally three to four cups of green tea a day. And if you, you know, my great uncle who lived to 104, um, he drank probably six, maybe 10 cups of green tea a day, um, was healthy until his very last breath. Wow. And um, uh, it's been shown that actually drinking green tea regularly lowers the risk of colon cancer, lung cancer, breast cancer, brain tumors. And so there's a lot of evidence, human evidence that actually shows that to be true. Um, tomatoes have uh, been shown to lower the risk of prostate cancer. We talked about that. Um, uh, 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 and, and eating um, good phytonutrient rich green vegetables um, also been shown to be protective against a whole flotilla of different types of cancers. And so one of the things I talk about in my book, and again, it's, you know, this is like a deep dive into this is, well, how much should you eat? How many how servings do you need to eat a week? Or if you eat seafood, um, like what type of fish and how often and how much fish should you eat a day? I'm, I'm somebody like, because I came out of the, you know, the biotech world, you know, like it's all about the dose, right? And actually I think, you know, uh, one of the famous uh, uh, Greek uh, philosophers basically saying, you know, the, the poison is in a dose. Anything that's too much or too little, it's gonna be not enough or too much. And so um, one of the things I've tried to do um, over the course uh, of the last year, uh, frankly, during the pandemic, I spent a lot of time thinking about how do I take a lot of this information that's been bottled up that like led to me to write the book and get it out to people. So I actually created an online course and I do master classes now to really get at those sort of nuts and bolts of details um, of, 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 of things. But um, uh, so I would say, follow the evidence. There are certain foods like green tea, like tree nuts, like tomatoes, like leafy greens, like seafood, and, and there's specific types of seafood. Um, you know, it's not just salmon, um, uh, uh, but even shellfish actually, and haddock and hake and some of these other things that consider. So again, if you if you only listen to the sort of the common urban mythology, you hear the same things. Eat your salmon, eat your kale, you know, uh, uh, and, and and it goes so much deeper than that. Like you you know you you prompted this a couple of times. You know. Is it as simple as, it's never as simple as, 
The God is always in the details. And those details allow us freedom to choose the things that we might like. It gives us more of a repertoire to go into. Yeah, I love that. Speaking of details, I mean, we've had we've had other researchers on the podcast and they talk about, you know, these really intricate details of our physiology, IGF-1, uh, mTOR, insulin. Do you, I mean, do those come up at all in your recommendations? Do you talk about, you know, minimizing glycemic variability with your dietary choices? Do you talk about, you know, keeping insulin low and not spiking it with, you know, uh, too many, eating con the consumption of too many carbohydrates, added sugars and things like that? Or is it more big picture for you? Just, you know, prioritizing food quality, which is well, what, here's the thing. What, which, what, it, what it sounds like to be. Well, here's the thing. I'm a researcher, so I am into those details, mm -hmm. the glycemic index, the CRPs, and all these other things that a lot of people talk about. But when I actually try to communicate to people who are really interested in changing their lives for the better, mm -hmm. just want to optimize their health, they don't want to be told, they don't need to know all the details. Right? They, they want to feel more empowered. And so I try to kind of um, up my own game by trying to simplify the details into things that people can use. Like, and if you want to have that conversation, you know, like if one wants to have that conversation about the tomatoes and how do you cook them and what happens to the chirality of the lycopene molecule, we can get into that stuff. But look, I just told you, if you're a man and you want to lower your risk of prostate cancer, tomatoes are great, two to three servings, half a cup each time. If you cook it, it actually makes it a little bit better for you. And if you are asking me, What's the most potent tomato that I should choose from? I would say San Marzano tomatoes hmm. actually have the highest amount of lycopene. Um, and, and, you know, like I, I like to actually message in ways that make sense to people that are really practical, but absolutely <clears throat> put me in the Olympic ring and give me an AP and we can fence and go into all those details. I love it. Were you a foodie before you became uh, a scientist? Like when, yeah, when did those two absolutely. passions for you converge? You know, I, first of all, grew up in a background, my Asian, my background is Asian, but I grew up in America. I was born here. And, you know, I, I ate a lot of fresh home cooked foods with fresh whole plant based foods all the time. Um, it was a treat when I had a sloppy Joe. I mean, it was a very rare day when I had a lasagna or whatever it was. I mean, I, I used to covet like, you know, those things like, oh man, my friends are having all this great stuff. But I, I really grew up eating a plant, mostly a plant based um, whole foods. Uh, diet. Um, but I, I also grew up in a family and with friends who really enjoyed eating. And so um, uh, when I went to college, I uh, love to explore foods. And a lot of people don't know this, but um, I, uh, I enjoy cooking. Uh, and if you, you, in order to enjoy cooking, to, in order to cook well, you have to love to eat, like to eat. And when I, when I finished college, I did a gap year before I went to medical school. And I actually, and this is, you know, I hate to say it, it's like 1984. I took a gap year and I went to Europe. And where did I live? I lived in Italy, in Greece. Why? Specifically to study the, the culture and traditions of food and how they related to health. So this is a long time ago before people were talking about the Mediterranean diet. I was living it by being there in, in Northern Italy and in, in, in traveling all around. I went over to Greece. I even went mountain climbing, because that's something that was a, a hobby of mine uh, back then. And I climbed up in the, this area called Mount Athos, which is like the theocratic republic of Eastern Orthodoxy, to get into monasteries, to study how monks or vegetarians live their lives. And I uh, volunteered uh, as a chef in a monastery um, and, you know, and like was stirring beans with this like canoe size spoon um, in this cauldron in this monastery that like cooked everything by fire. Um, and, and so, you know, like, yeah, I, I am a foodie. And I, I think that, again, this intimacy um, is something that's very personal to me as it is to everybody. But I love like exploration. I, I just think that, you know, um, I, I would tell you, I love food. I respect food. I, I wouldn't say I love to eat. So I'm not somebody that shovels food down my mouth. I I like to taste. I like to explore. I like to understand. And I, and I think that that's a, 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 something I like to share with people. I really appreciate that. And I can, I can totally relate as well. You mentioned as one of your five pillars, uh, the immune system. And, mm -hmm. you know, we've heard a lot about inflammation. Inflammation is a feature of the immune system. Uh, it's not necessarily bad. It's not necessarily good. Can you talk to my audience a little bit about 
what inflammation is and maybe the foods that can help dampen inflammation in the body. Because we know that sure. inflammation plays such an important role in the etiology of chronic disease. Absolutely. So um, first of all, if we didn't have inflammation, we probably would have died as kids because when we cut ourselves, you know, uh, on a swimming set or, uh, you know, on building blocks or, you know, a scuffle in the schoolyard or whatever it is, um, you know, that cut that you get, we fall off your bicycle, you skin your knee. What's the first thing that happens? You get a little bit of redness. It's painful. We get a little bit of redness, a little bit of swelling that inflammation, that's inflammation. That's our body's natural first line of defense. And inflammation uh, is, a, is just one part of our immune system. It's the front line. And it's designed inherently to get rid of bacteria that might enter the body if we actually are injured. So a little inflammation is really, really important. And what our body knows how to do is to ramp up the inflammation quickly, which is why when you cut yourself, I and mean, you get that swelling within seconds, frankly, definitely within minutes. And then what happens over the course of a day or two days or three days, your body tones that down, turns the volume way down and then turns it off. So inflammation is a defensive part of our immune system that our body turns on and then turns off. If you can't turn it off, you get chronic information, inflammation. And that's the problem that we see in chronic diseases. In diabetes, we've got chronic inflammation. In heart disease, chronic inflammation. Cancer, chronic inflammation. And chronic inflammation triggers other diseases as well. It's kind of like, um, here's the analogy. Um, we know that when man, humans made fire, we suddenly had the power to be able to warm ourselves and cook our food, okay? Um, and we want to keep that fire in a little fire pit. Um, uh, and, and that's where fire was useful to us. And we know that, you know, after the evening, you put the fire out, then you go out and forage or whatever it is. So turning it down at the very end. Now imagine if the fire doesn't go out and worse, imagine the fire pops out of the fire pit and catches the forest on fire. Mm. Now you got the wildfire, right? And this is what's going on in our country right now. We got these raging wildfires going everywhere, destroying things. That's what happens. That's the inflammation we were really talking about. But I, I always try to point out to people, you don't want to eliminate inflammation. You want to kind of turn it way down. So what are some ways to turn down inflammation in using food? Again, here's the science. Um, it turns out that there's a lot of different food substances that can turn down inflammation. Green tea will turn down inflammation. Um, vitamin C, simple vitamin C, which is found in so many foods, can also turn down inflammation. So um, uh, red bell peppers, strawberries, um, uh, guava, uh, tomatoes, uh, oranges, citrus, of course, are great sources of vitamin C. I just gave you a handful of things you could sprinkle over the course of the day. Now, how do we know that vitamin C does this? Again, it's not theoretical. Like that's one of the things that I try to bring to the table is, you know, what happens in a lab is in a lab, you know, it's like Vegas, <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> stays in the lab. But what happens in people? Well, that actually makes a difference. And when you find it in the lab and in people, now you got my attention. Well, so studies have been done with people with inflammatory autoimmune diseases where they've got like runaway inflammation. And there was a study in Japan looking at lupus. So in the Miyagi prefecture in Japan, there's like this lupus center where you know, it's like a lupus out of control. And they found that people, women mostly with lupus who had this chronic inflammation, that if they, that those women who ate more vitamin C containing foods, like guava, tomatoes, strawberries, you know, all uh, uh, those kinds of things, bell peppers, they had high levels of vitamin C and they had lower levels of inflammation as measured by CRP. And they had less lupus flares. That's human. That's feasible. And that can be delicious as well. Yeah. So I have to ask, um, have, tr have there been trials to look at supplemental vitamin C and have they seen the same results? Cause that, I believe you know, I that that study that you just referenced, I mean, it sounded to me like a, like an observational, uh, study, right? So have they been able to yeah, tease so it out and look at, and look at supplementary vitamin C? So, so here's not, not yet to my knowledge. And here's part of the problem. Once you get to a randomized double blind placebo controlled clinical trial approved by an institutional review board in a hospital, and you wanna get these people with lupus. The, the research um, is now changing, but the old school way, you're gonna get people with runaway out of control lupus at the end of their game, okay? Mm. Uh, and then they're gonna be also be on steroids and they're gonna be on all of these monoclonal antibodies. And now you're not really studying kind of the real world anymore. You're, you're taking the train wrecks, the worst of the worst, and trying to see if a vitamin is gonna make a dent. Mm. I'm talking about people that, you know, are living their lives normally, not in a hospital and are just trying to get their 
stuff under control, right? And, and so that's where these observational studies um, are, to your point, they're important hypothesis generation, but the hypothesis should be tested, but the hypothesis is also easily tested by people as soon as they hear about it in their home that night when they, after they hear about it, um, food has immediacy. So what I would say is that we should all be eager to conduct our own clinical studies on ourselves if we think that there is a study um, and good science uh, that actually points the finger towards a direction that we can actually get behind. Yeah. One of the most, I think, uh, typically when people think of inflammation and, and s supplements that are commonly uh, talked about, uh, they think fish oil, omega-3 fatty acids. What are your thoughts on those as a potential anti-inflammatory um, uh, uh, the, the The fish oil has been studied as a supplement. Um, uh, and, you know, I think that the a large body of evidence is that it does have good anti-inflammatory benefits, it lowers CRP, um, it can improve arthritis symptoms of pain and swelling and lower medication uh, needs. And it also seems to have some improvement in dementia in clinical trials, like prospective clinical trials. And they think it's by lowering inflammation as well. So again, um, yet another kind of, I would say, brick to put on this wall mm -hmm. that what we eat can make a difference. But here's what I, what I would tell you, like some people um, love to take supplements. I know people who, you know, they, that's their thing. They mm -hmm. want to take a bunch of pills in the morning and, and they feel good about them. And I'm, I'm okay with that. But if you can eat, if you can get the, if you can get the same substance from a whole food and get your protein um, and get diversity, because our bodies are designed for diversity. We're not, we're not one trick ponies, you know? So um, uh, if you can get uh, omega-3 fatty acids from eating salmon, anchovy, hake, sardines, uh, manila clams, you know, I think that's great because you're, you're getting, you're testing your body, you're, uh, you're, you're, you're stretching your body's repertoire of responding to the things we're putting into it in ways that activate your health advances. And, I, and that, that, that's my own personal way of actually trying to get omega-3s. Yeah, I, I would definitely have to agree with you because you're also getting all these other, as you mentioned, protein, but uh, even on top of that, there's all these additional nutrients um, that are strengthening, strengthening the, the entirety of the system, you know, take salmon, yeah. for example, loaded yeah. with astaxanthin. And, and by the way, here, here's, here, here's a cool piece of research that a lot of people don't know. Um, uh, sea bass, which also contains omega-3 fatty acids have been found by researchers in Guangzhou to actually contain a, they think it's a peptide, but it actually is in the meat itself. And, and, you know, only recently discovered that actually speeds up wound healing. And so they're you know, like that, that's a really cool idea. And, and, and that's to me, you know, scientists get excited by the unknown. A lot of people think that scientists spend all their time talking about all the stuff they know, the brainiacs, actually, when you get a group of scientists together, like when I have, when I get together for dinner with my, my science buddies, you know, it's not that we geek out talking about all the stuff that we know, uh, like engineers, you know, like we scientists, biology scientists actually spend, spend a lot of time talking about what we don't know. Hmm. Yeah. You, did you know, did you know what we don't know? Like, how do we, how would we answer this question? And that's what I would say is um, so exciting about food and health. We are really at the beginning of a new era of really being able to truly understand not only what's in our food, but how our body responds to what we put inside it. And metabolism is a whole other dimension of this that is coming down the pike as well. Yeah. And we know so important, especially over the past year, metabolism and metabolic health has really come into the spotlight as being something that we all need to be, ought to be conscious of. And unfortunately, so few are. Hey guys, if you enjoyed that conversation, you're gonna love this one. For listeners that are not familiar with BDNF, what is that essentially? BDNF is the main, what's called neurotrophin. And a neurotrophin is a nerve growth factors. And so these are proteins that are coded for in our DNA. And when they get expressed, they create these, these molecules, these proteins, and, and the uh, BDNF does a variety of things. It induces the birth of new brain cells or, or, or promotes that in the hippocampus called neurogenesis. And then it also helps brain cells with like brain cell resilience. Like I, I think about BDNF a little bit like, you know, like a good coach, right? That like when, if I'm a little brain cell, when I'm like not, you know, still like too much for me, like too much cortisol, too much bad news, too, I just can't handle the stress. I'm going to, I'm going to call it quits. And they're like, hey, you can still do a little brain cell. And, and BDNF kind of coaxes brain cells to stay alive. And then the most important thing, I guess, 
is to make new connections. If hmm. you think in this very concrete way, what does our brain do? How do we know a healthy brain? A healthy brain is really connected up. You're connected to yourself and your own intention and, and your, your focus and your work. You're connected to the people around you that matter in a, in a meaningful way. Um, and, and so I like this idea of thinking of the brain as, as our organ of connection and that you can even see that on the biological level. BDNF increases brain connections. If you look at all, all of these you know, kind of new wave of medications and, and um, molecules being looked at for antidepressant effect, ketamine and psilocybin, all of these, you know, they, they all seem to function really by inducing rapid sprouting of neurons. And we, we generally understand that to be a BDNF regulated process. That's amazing. Exercise is one of the most well-established ways of upregulating BDNF, right? Yep. I like that one because we feel it. You know, like you get done with it, everyone, uh, you get you get done with that workout. And, and not that that's immediate BDNF. We used to think like, oh, you don't feel it that fast. It's like, well, you know, you, you feel ketamine that fast when it works as an antidepressant. It works within a few hours usually. And so it's kind of remarkable. Um, but yeah, I love I love um, the way that exercise, like food, can really be one of those things. When you see people get better and beat depression, not always, you can beat depression in other ways, but it, that's usually part of the package that people bring to the table. Yeah. Are there foods that you're aware of that can also uh, lead to an increase in BDNF? So the way that we back into foods is looking at the nutrients that can increase or influence the BDNF gene. Hmm. And so I know of six uh, nutrients with significant evidence that they influence BDNF, or there's a molecular pa pathway by which they do. And let me see if I can name all. There's, there's zinc, there are uh, the long-chain omega-3 fats, but particularly DHA. Uh, magnesium, there's actually a paper where they look at the mechanism of ketamine and they also look at the mechanism of magnesium and, and they're, they're pretty close. Um, there's the, um, there's a flavanol or some of the flavanols, uh, the polyphenols can induce, and there, there are a couple of different ones of those that, that seem to be able to help with BDNF. That's for, I'm going to guess, uh, oh, I think B12. And then I'm going to guess iron is my last one, but I, I might not remember Max. I, th I think that was more than th that. that, what, that I think was that, six. Was, that was six. Okay. That was six. Interesting. Let me just go back and say five. Okay. okay. There were, and, and four, I'm sure. Of. Well, <laughs> well, I love that, that week that we have these nutrients because they're pretty ubiquitous, like in the food supply, if you know where to look for them. Yeah. I, I think I, I mean, as a, a physician, we don't get a lot of training in, in nutrition, but actually my last book in some ways was just really about that. Here are these 21 nutrients that really matter. And in this book, uh, Eat to Be Depression and, and Anxiety, I focus on 12 because we looked in the literature, um, Dr. Laura Latrance and I did a little paper called Antidepressant Foods. Because as we were starting to think about teaching clinicians about this, all right, this makes sense. There's lots of biomolecular pathways that support this. Now there's lots of correlational and now clinical data. No, let's let's start talking to clinicians and see what happens. And then we kind of scratched our heads, like, well, what food are you, you going to tell them to prescribe? And be like, you you all just tell the patients Mediterranean diet, do it, olive oil all the time. And and we wanted to kind of back it up a little bit more. And so we looked in the literature and we found there are twelve nutrients really that seem uh, to have a very high level of evidence that they are involved in the prevention and the treatment of depression. Hmm. So you look at something like zinc, populations that that eat less zinc have more depression. You look at people who get depressed, they have overall and as a population level, lower levels of zinc. You look at what zinc does, mm, it induces BDNF. It's involved in like 300 different chemical reactions in the brain. And, and then you get to, okay, well, what foods have the most zinc? And the plant-based foods with uh, um, the most zinc um, are things that, you know, uh, oftentimes get concerned in terms of absorption, but in the plant and the animal world, it's oysters. And then you think, well, what are the nutrients in an oyster? Hmm. And you get this real quick, basic lesson of nutritional psychiatry, which is about nutrient density, where when you look at an oyster, you see long-chain omega-3 fats, you see a plethora of B12, you see selenium, you see zinc, you see iron. You see almost all the nutrients I just named that seem to promote BDNF. And so as you think about then seeking a diet where for the fewest number of calories, you're getting the most nutrients for your brain. And, and that's really where the food recommendations from Eat to Be Depression and Anxiety come from. Just taking these foods and thinking, or rather taking these nutrients and thinking, what are the foods with the most of them? 
How do we help people integrate those foods into their life in a meaningful way? And most importantly, I think the piece that really gets missed and I do think sets nutritional psychiatry apart is we start to really then look at food categories. So you don't have to eat the kale and the oysters if those are disgusting to you. And as a psychiatrist, I'm really interested in your joyfulness as an eater. There's this, this chapter in the book called Eater Heal Thyself, where I just think right now in particular, and I think makes you, you, you know this as well as anyone better than most of us, right? is how, how kind of confused people are, how influenced people are, um, how badly people are hurting in terms of really wanting to put their effort into uh, changes in their life and their food that work. And, and so it was really important to me to, to present the information in a really balanced way that helps people transcend some of these debates that are not the right debate, that you should eat meat or eat Impossible Burger. I, I don't think that's the right debate to be having right now. The right debate that we should be having right now is how can we all support one another and ourselves to really get motivated to feed our mental health and feed our brains. I think that's, that's, that, that's the, at least that's what I hope shifts and happens. Yeah. Well, you mentioned, you mentioned oysters because they are very rich in zinc. What are some other foods that are uh, on this list of 12, is it 12 foods to beat depression? Well, there's, there's the power players in the book and those are the foods that really I wanted to highlight because they represent food categories so well. So well, we don't want to, we don't want to give them all away, but we what can about- give them all away. This is the genius life podcast. I mean, I was thinking on the way over here as if you're thinking like how, I think all of the, you know, all of probably the foods on my list are foods, foods, um, in your books too. I think there's a pretty, pretty, I think we just, there's a lot of bias support here, but I'm, <laughs> I'm okay with all the debate going on. I'm okay to be here. This, this is a safe place. It feels like. it, it is. And I, there it's okay if there's overlap and you have 12 foods. I, you know, I only have 10 genius foods. So you found at least two foods. Well, maybe that maybe. were maybe not this... on my radar when I wrote genius foods. So I want to, I want to get into, we can, we can go through six. What are six of the you already listed oysters, but what are some other foods? Yeah, let's talk about some of the other foods that I think are important in terms of why they're on there conceptually. Because again, whether those are the foods or not for you, it's more of what do they represent? Like why is kefir on the list? It's a fermented dairy product. It's a more liquidy than yogurt. It also has more colony forming units than really any other food. If mm. you look in the sciences, when you're thinking about a probiotic, you'll see it's got you know 2 billion or 50 billion or 100 billion. Well, well the live bacteria is in kefir. There are some actually studies showing a serving of kefir can have up to a trillion colony forming units, wow. which I'd never seen in a probiotic. But I also think it teaches us something about the importance of fermented foods and where they come for, from, um, what they meant to us historically. Uh, so kefir is on the list as, as are other fermented foods. Cashews. Wait, before you go into cashews, kefir, there are a number of different types of kefir of, uh, available to your average consumer. We have like coconut, Oh wow, that's kefir. right. We have yeah. dairy kefir. Know, yeah. Is there a preference? What if you're what if you're trying to be dairy free? Then I don't think you should drink a dairy kefir. I think that's that's not going to be good for you. Fair. Is <laughs> coconut kefir a better a, a good second place option? I think so in the, in the sense that as you ferment really anything, whether it's kombucha, you're fermenting tea and sugar, um w whether it's uh you know what do they ferment in the coconut fermented drink? Is that coconut milk? That's a good, well, coconut, coconut water has coconut. sugar in it. So yeah. I would imagine it's a substrate for some, you know. So I think that there's those, some, some bacteria out there. I think happy those are that. interesting replacements. I think that one of the nice things about kefir, and I guess why it's on the list, is I, I think it's an interesting way to be provocative about the dairy concerns that sometimes people have. Because as you ferment dairies, you tend to get rid of lactose, just like when you ferment glutinous materials you tend to get rid of gluten there's actually a study of a double gluten fermentation that re removed all of the gluten you could literally label it as gluten free wow so fermentation is a, as a as a powerful thing hmm. um but yes i think the short answer is if kefir is not your thing find some fermented foods and experiment with them and see and see what can work for you um cashews cashews have just been a big part of our house since we started having kids because when you have kids there's this whole like like anxiety trip when do you feed them nuts and it's like a deep rabbit hole to get into on the internet and and so we started being really strange parents we started like chewing up nuts and feeding them to our children like like little like like kind of like birds i guess it's, <laughs> i don't know Probably it's gonna horrify everyone but yeah that's what we did and and then cashews entered our life just because um breast milk tends not to have as much iron it's definitely by far the best food for babies but 
um, cashews are a higher iron containing nut. So certainly not the only iron containing food we gave our kids, but, but one of them. Um, some of the other foods on there, red peppers, just looking, vitamin C was one of the nutrients made the list and, and everyone goes to citrus. That's a fine choice, but I just uh, like peppers and in, in using them in food and, and red peppers just have a plethora of vitamin C. Um, Did you know that red peppers, like all nightshades have, uh, have trace amounts of caffeine, uh, not caffeine, nicotine in them? Uh, you know, I, I, I have heard that and th yeah, I think that that's uh that's one of those fascinating things you see in the plant world these this homology that exists right where you get things like you know melatonin in plants cherries right yeah, actually a lot of different foods cherries have a little tiny bit hmm. um and they all actually have a little they all have like picograms it's like little tiny amounts but it's just a, it's fascinating that we think about how intertwined we are with these other organisms and how we share common molecules. It's it's I think really inspiring. I think it's also one of the reasons I end up being I wouldn't say a luddite. I just really trust traditional foods. Is I just think look, there's a lot that's been going on that you don't have any idea about you and me, right? The microbiome. Ten years ago, we wouldn't even mention that word. We were like bugs in your gut, and those wouldn't be part of talking about depression and anxiety. And, and so I just, I trust natural foods because I think that's where we came from and that's what our brains have been made out of. And currently there's a lot of reasons, a lot of things informing the mental health epidemic, but certainly one of them that looked real suspicious to me in the data has been the way that we've changed how we food nourish our brains. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, that's a big, that's a big rabbit hole to go down. But yeah, I mean, the, the uber hyper industrial industrialization of our food supply, you know, our, the, our just chronic exposure to industrially produced toxicants, whether they're endocrine disruptors or heavy metals, you name it. But, um, but that's the subject for a different, for a different conversation. We were up to bell peppers. Well, let's talk about some other foods. Let's definitely talk about some seafoods. And that was, um, the, the book ends with a six week plan really to try and do what we do in our clinic, which just help people jumpstart their motivation transcend all of the strange voices we hear in our here in our heads about and on the internet about food and what we should do and really think about you and your life where you are what goals you have and how you can evolve as an eater and, and so uh, seafood is a really important category hmm. it, it just it is where you find these long chain omega-3 fats you also just find a lot of nutrient density when you look at salmon or anchovies or oysters or clams and mussels and so anchovies and wild salmon were the two that i thought were most accessible to people and really that you can find in, in very budget friendly ways. There's mm -hmm. a lot of, of course, concern about, you know, are these foods accessible to people? That's one of my favorite recipes in the book is the salmon burgers. You ask if I'm a chef and let me tell you, I feel like the best chef in the world when my children eat these wild salmon burgers because it, you can do them as little croquettes and they're delicious. You can do them with a variety of different, you know, either an almond flour or a coconut. I mean, you can really... Uh, use a lot of different uh, bases in, in the book. We make them a couple of different ways. Um, a honey soy and a kind of dilly, um, dill salmon burger. But they're in there because of nutrient density, because of the omega-3 fats. And also just because seafood tends to, if you look at all these traditional diets that are really, really healthy for the brain, Japanese diet, um, a Norwegian diet, uh, the Mediterranean diet, there's just more seafood in there than Americans tend to consume. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. I'm a huge fan of anchovies. I'm glad that you brought those up. They're uh, they're totally sort of underutilized, right? Totally. Like we just we just learned about them in America. Like ooh, like they're on pizza and they stink. And it's just like that's just so. I mean, first of all, that's not true. But it's not true. A lot of people say that about sardines. I've n I don't find that they. I understand why people have this trepidation to try them. You know that that they they're a little slimy, but they've never they don't stink to me. I I get that. I was really sensitive to seafood. I didn't eat any seafood till I was maybe like thirty, and and so I do, I do the way that like, they do smell a little fishy to me. Even do salmon they? sometimes is a little, for me, it's just a little, I just think I'm sensitive to fish. I, I, I like it all now, but I think it takes a little while to develop the palate. How, what do you, what's, what are, what are some good ways to do anchovies in the house? Oh man. Well, I just, I find that anchovies in a salad are just game changed, like game changed, especially if you. There's a dressing that I have in um, in Genius Foods. It's like a nutritional yeast based dressing where it's basically uh, it's extra virgin olive oil, apple cider vinegar, nutritional yeast, salt, pepper, and uh, it's like this like cheesy 
And the fishies. Don't forget the fishies. Well, no, here's the thing. So the, so the anchovies are not included in that, in that salad dressing just because I knew that it would turn people off. But if you throw anchovies into that, it's just amazing. So yeah. So just, I mean, but any salad, like make, make a salad, put anchovies into it. Don't forget that anchovies are generally used in Caesar salad dressing, that, which is my, amazing. My all kale Caesar salad, my favorite kale Caesar, my favorite Caesar salad or just salad recipe is the all kale Caesar, lacinato kale, chiffonade. Uh, so it's just roll them up and slice it real thin. And then uh, a Caesar, a Caesar dressing with lots of anchovies. Recipe developer was like, you can't put in more anchovies. It's like, <laughs> I want to put in more. No, anchovies are, if you're, if you got, if you're listening to this and you haven't tried it, just try them. Just make sure that it's, it's, it can be hard to find anchovies in extra virgin olive oil. Yep. Um, Get them in extra virgin olive oil, make a vinaigrette, make a uh, maxi salad dressing and, and mix them in, make the all kale Caesar in each be depression and anxiety and make pasta. I mean the, the anchovy yes. or sardine pasta, like, oh, so good. Yeah. You can also find anchovy paste, which if the idea of eating like an anchovy Yep. weirds you out you can find the paste that's an easy hack for the also for the caesar salad dressings where you just put a little squirt in mix it in with your whatever you like to put in there olive oil mayo and, yeah and uh you know whatever your cheese of choice is let's talk briefly about plant-based diets um there's a lot of reasons why people adopt plant-based diets right and um whatever reason is your reason you know if you happen to be on a plant-based diet totally fine but from the from your vantage point as a mental health expert, do plant based diets concern you? Plant based diets concern me because it's a dietary pattern that requires supplementation. Um, th that you might be able to debate that a little bit now. There have been some B twelve analogs I think found in um, a couple types of algae. Um, and long chain omega-3 fats. I, th I think, you know, one might be able to argue you make those, right? So it's not exactly an essential fat, although they're, they're essential fats. So, and then when you look at some of the data, you know, if you just want to cherry pick like some of the concerning stuff, like the Epic Oxford study that found 40, I'm sorry, 52% of male vegans were B12 deficient. So there's frankly B12 deficient. And then 20, I think 3%, uh, additionally, were B12 insufficient, meaning that your level is normal, but it's so low that it's not really offering you the mental health um, and brain benefits that a normal B12 level offers. So you can certainly supplement, as, as every vegan listening knows. So I think that, um, but it just concerns me. It concerns me to kind of direct people towards a diet that you need a supplement to, uh, for. Um, it concerns me because of manure. And because of animal husbandry, um, we don't have lots of animals on our farm, but but we've been till the raccoon ate all of them, um, and a gray fox, like a big gray fox, and I'm pretty sure ate some of them. But we we've been living with chickens for the past um, couple of years, and it's it's just a really um, it's just an interesting experience as human to have these animals that we hatch some chickens and they imprint it on us. So you like walk out the door and they like come to you. And then they give you food. And then they also like scratch around and fertilize your garden because they have this really wonderful high nitrogen poop. And, and you feel that you're part of this food cycle, part of the farm cycle. And so maybe that's just like nostalgia, I guess. But, but it, it seems to me there's something going on there. Does that mean that we should have massive factory farms and we should have everyone eating lots and lots of meat? I, I, don't, I don't think so. But to me, it means that there's something, um, something very human about living in existence uh, with animals um, that that includes eating them, at least for, for me in the path I've chosen. Now, I've also, I was a vegetarian for 10 years and I didn't feel that way. I was in a period of my life where meat grossed me out. Um, the smell of meat grossed me out. Um, so I've obviously in my own way, I guess, evolved and shifted. And I think for anybody listening, that's just my, my request as a psychiatrist is that, that uh, you have a plan that makes sense to you. I mean, that's really the work or our work in mental health is, you know, it's not to indoctrinate people into me. I mean, you can really tell I approach nutrition, I think, I hope like a psychiatrist, which our job is really to live in a world with a stance of, of neutrality and encouragement that I'm not trying to make you eat like me. I'm hoping to give you some guidelines to help you eat like you. And so that's, that's where I, I try to, I wouldn't say bypass the issue. I just, I don't know, I've been doing this for 10 years. I'm tired of debating whether people should eat a hamburger or not, because I think that's your decision. That's not my decision. Um, and I think people 
can argue the data either way at this point. Um, I think some of the other concerns probably that, 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 yeah, so the manure is a big concern. I went out to the biggest kale field in America back in my like kale hero days. And, uh, that's when we max, what man, max intervened. He helped me. He's like, pulled me aside. He's like, bro, you got to expand beyond the kale. Like, <laughs> Live beyond the kale, max. Were you vegetarian at that point? No, I came out of the vegetarianism before I met you. Hmm. And it was interesting. It was also the low fat vegetarian, a lot of snack oil cookies. I think that maybe I'm a little scarred by that of just, I've believed it, right? Don't eat cholesterol. And then you look at like, what's the data supporting dietary cholesterol being an evil component of the human diet? And it's not very impressive, dietary cholesterol. Cholesterol levels, for sure, important, important part of, of prevention and, and cardiology. But dietary cholesterol, hmm, I wasn't very, at least I just wasn't impressed by the amount of data that there was. Um, and so those are some of the, uh, but, but anyway, this big kale field, you're standing there and we drove by it and it's grown in the manure from the local dairy farms. And you're sitting there looking at that, the, you know, what that organic kale represents to the plant-based movement. And then you're looking at the reality of where it comes from, and that it doesn't exist without the dairy industry. And that it, it and it just, and actually it was growing in between all those kale plants was purslane which is an even more nutrient dense kale or, or even more nutrient dense than kale is probably the best green out there. And it's just laid to waste. It's not even purslane. Purslane is the highest. I mean, if you're looking for plant-based omega threes, it's the highest uh, plant-based ALA containing food. Um, and it is just incredibly nutrient dense. It grows as a weed in most people's gardens. It's got a little succulent look to it and it's got a little kind of a citrusy, almost um viscous you might even say like that not the slime of okra but just a little bit more viscosity like a almost like a succulent plant it's really nice on a grill if you take a spring like a sprig of it you can grill it and super it's got a yeah, really really nice so so manure b12 and the omega-3 fats and and then um in terms of the um the ethics of it sorry i keep saying this the ethics of it I, well I, I'm probably not the best person to talk about that, but in my own thinking, th there's something about the value of life and the importance of having gratitude for your food. And whether you're taking the life of a plant, whether you're taking the life of an animal, I think being more aware and involved in that process is, is certainly one of the things from the vegan movement that I think it's important that everybody adopts. Um, cause I think that leads you to a lot of different places and, and a lot of, it's certainly those types of ideas thinking about the environmental impact of my food, thinking about um, the cruelty around the food that I eat. Th those all really influenced me and in how I've developed my eating over the past, I don't know, decade. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Having empathy and gratitude for, for the animals that were, you know, unwittingly sacrificed, you know, for your benefit, I think is a very important part of the equation. Um, and it really bothers me that, that people have this um, perception that, that, that you know it's sort of this mutually exclusive scenario where if you eat meat then you can't possibly care about animals you can do both you can be an omnivore and you can also deeply care about the environment and animals and it's just like this straw man argument that has come from i have no idea where but um but if you're an empathetic person but you also care about the health of yourself and your loved ones you can embody both and you should embody both I think people have a really hard time with death, Max. I mean, I think it's just something that we tend to avoid. I think as I've gotten to sit with people, as they think about their own mortality, and one of the things that kind of happens in a psychiatrist's office or as they struggle with grief and grieving when they lose someone. And, and I think that the, there's something about the way that um, life and death and nourishment get caught up and in, intertwined together that is just, I don't know, it's easy to oversimplify it. Mm. And... and and I certainly respect that um, one, of, one of my my favorite vegans said to me, it's it's not so much that I object to eating meat every now and then. I just know I won't make the right choices. And I just don't want to be involved in that system. And 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 I can really appreciate that. I, I wouldn't say I always make the, you know, my own kind of quote unquote right choices. Um, it's also interesting during the pandemic for the first time really, I kind of moved to a really pastured centered type meat. Um, we buy a, a quarter of a cow from our neighbor. And so we actually raise some of the hay that it's fed and you know, can watch them grow up. It's really, you know, kind of idyllic and really, you know, purely grass fed animals. And, um, 
And then I like doing that meat share because it also challenges me as a cook where instead of just getting, you know, in that rut that Americans in, right? Strip, strip steaks, ribeyes, and burgers. And that, that's, and filet mignon. Those are my four love languages right there. Right, right. exactly, exactly. And, and I don't think, I think you also, I mean, I think you love, I, I think you speak a little like beef shank. I think you probably speak <laughs> a little brisket. You just had brisket for lunch. I, I mean, I don't, don't, don't say you like you don't speak. You know, that's what, but they challenge you to use those other, uh, other cuts of meat, right? How to learn to use a slow cooker, how to make a great beef stew. And, and I really appreciated that in terms of expanding my own way that just my family and I use meat. Also, I think it's just interesting around kids. I mean, certainly there's a big debate around veganism and vegetarianism in kids because kids don't really get to make a choice. And there's, there's not good data. I mean, I think that, that there's so much kind of saber rattling and so much um, animosity in the conversation and so much yelling right now that, uh, you know, sometimes it feels like we really need to step back and say like, okay, there's really not a lot of data for a lot of this stuff. And there certainly has not been longitudinal studies of veganism in, in childhood. That it, um, So, uh, yeah, and then there are some concerning studies. Like there's the case series of uh, looking at B12 deficiency in women during pregnancy. It was uh, looking at a group that had um, half the group had pernicious anemia. So that's an autoimmune disorder by which you end up not being able to absorb B12. And then the other group had uh, were vegans. And they just found lasting neurological and neurocognitive effects that just the, the kids who um, came out of a vegan pregnancy tend to have... Uh, a, this maybe I just want to talk about the results of the study, but it sounds like I'm saying something worse than I am, but they tend to have smaller um, heads. There, there were some cognitive findings. I'm not going to remember the exact details and I don't want to get them wrong on your podcast, but mm -hmm. just, the, just the bottom line of that, that is um, concerning. Again, when you just think about uh, thinking about a population really giving up foods that generally we have always eaten. I mean, there, there haven't been any purely vegan societies and i think there's probably some reasoning behind that I remember once someone told me they found one and like then that meant something and i was thinking well the majority haven't been and also even if you found a like vegan society like does that necessarily mean that it's healthy mm. right? or, or that it's good for cognitive benefits and that's where i'm saying like i think there's a lot of debating right now sometimes without a lot of data and so i think what's most important as a physician and mental health professional that people should know is you should have your b12 level checked whether you're mm. a vegan vegetarian or not and your vitamin d level and you should make sure that you have enough of those you should think about things like the omega-3 fats in your diet and if there are some things for example if you don't want to eat anything that has a face or eat anything with a mother i don't know what about a clam a clam is the top nutritional source of vitamin B12. If you're a, a flexible vegan, I've, I've met a lot of folks who are vegans and then they hear about mussels and clams and they're foods that they've already either eaten or liked or part of their cultures. I want one worked with a, a woman um, from uh, Belgium and she mm. was a vegan. And then we're going through her food history and I sort of mentioned mussels, clams and oysters. So oh, I'm a vegan except for those. Mm. And I was like, well, that's, you know, that that's what you need. As you know, our friend Mark Hyman with the Pegan diet, I mean, there's some, a lot of that makes perfect sense in terms of let's just go over the stuff that we all agree on. Olive oil, good, plants, good, seafood, good. So. Yeah. I mean, I just, God, there's so much there. And I just, I love everything that you've just said. I've, I've said publicly and I, and I stand by this fully that I, you know, I would have no problem uh, loving somebody, being in a relationship with somebody who is plant-based or, or mostly plant-based, but I would not procreate with somebody who was not willing to, at least during the carriage of the pregnancy, uh, consume meat and animal products. And what about if they wanted to supplement like you and your your vegan girlfriend? I like imagining this, like Max's super vegan girlfriend. And I and I'd like to talk, we could probably spend a little bit of this podcast talking about how to find her, Max, if you want. I mean, maybe I, I, I love, I love talking to people about the relationships, but even if she took like a, a long chain omega-3 fat supplement, an algal supplement and a B12 supplement, or a prenatal vitamin, or she's eating like lots of, lots of healthy plants. I mean, I feel like that would be, um, and she loves you a lot, Max. She wants to have a baby with you. And well, first of all, I wouldn't impose my way of thinking on anybody else. So nobody else, nobody listening to this. I mean, I'm not saying that you 
can't Except and shouldn't procreate with somebody. Future vegan girlfriends of Max might want to pay attention. To this, I so. personally wouldn't want to risk that. And I also feel like what you just described, like looking at each nutrient in accordance with the current body of literature, that's what that is, is that's nutrientism or nutritionism, mm-hmm. you know, where we make the attempt, right. you know, the with feeble attempt, let's with, just call it that. With utter hubris, right? To think that we know exactly what it is in animal products that, uh, a neonate needs to cog to cognitively and you know in every other way physiologically flourish right i just don't trust our knowledge that much and i would default i i would want i would want to default to you know eating the foods that i know that human beings ate during the time in which our brains evolved um Choline, for example, you didn't mention choline. I didn't mention choline. Choline actually, it didn't make the list of twelve nutrients on the antidepressant food scale, and we added it because choline, like folate, is very much tied to pregnancy outcomes. Mm. So folate, the reason folic acid is in a prenatal vitamin is that if you have low folate, folic acid uh, during pregnancy, or dur- you end up with what are called neural t- neural tube defects. That literally, there aren't enough B vitamin or methyl groups to close um this is the the um the neural tube so as the kind of you go from you know 16 cells to like a little creature with a spinal cord um that that doesn't go as well if you don't have enough folate well the same types of data exist for choline and you find choline i like choline because you find it in eggs and tofu and so it really it really like splits everybody in terms of a nutrient that um uh are two foods that tend to, you know, track with different um, types of dietary <laughs> tribes. But choline is just one of, and it's actually one of the only nutrients that's really tied to anxiety, just a correlational cross-sectional study, but still that it's, um, it's an interesting nutrient. Yeah. I see. I think that that would be the compromise the, and the compromise, which if you're in a relationship with somebody, because again, I didn't say that I wouldn't, that I wouldn't be in a relationship with somebody on a plant-based diet, but if they weren't willing to meet me halfway during the pregnancy when we're co-creating, what food would you have her um, meet you halfway with? Meet me at like you know, I mean, at the very least, take like beef liver supplements. You don't even have beef, to eat it. Beef liver is, I mean, I don't know. That's not. I don't think that's halfway. That's like that's pretty. I mean, that's like pretty a, hardcore. It's a little aggro. I mean, the <laughs> liver is, you know, I mean, but they make them in pills. You can buy beef liver pills. I know. I know they make everything in pills now. I really kind of a it's a strange, it's a strange world we're in, Max. By the way, also the new the the foods that um, the mother eats also influences the nutritional composition composition of breast milk. For sure, that was. I mean, um, that yeah, that was uh, a part of I guess my dad' life over the past decade was was um, my my wife breastfed for a long time, and it was really just interesting as a man to participate with that. Um, it's funny when you drink breast milk or talk about having tried breast milk, how many people are like pro brain health and pro food and really like woke in lots of ways. And then they like make a retching sound. And I think it's like one of the most misogynistic things I've, I've ever seen because because breast milk's really delicious. It's a little bit sweet. Um, it's by far the best brain food. And, and I think it's, uh, yeah, it's one of those things that certainly food affects. Also, the palate of the child hmm. is influenced. So if you're a mom just eating lots and lots of processed food, so lots and lots of sweets, lots of sugar, right, you're you're going to have a breast milk that, um, and the child's going to have an in utero experience where taste develops. It's just different than a mom that's you know eating lots of garlic and lots of seafood. And so, you know, again, there's, when you're thinking about having kids and starting a family, I just think these are the types of things that make parents really, really neurotic. Uh, but there, I think, is great data and, and, and beyond that, just lots of great experience of how having a family can be done in really, really healthy ways. I think that's exactly the opposite of what gets marketed to us as parents, where like, oh, you see your commercials of like, it's total chaos, time to order in. Or, <laughs> you know, don't you need like more processed food to make your life convenient? Or like, don't you need some gel that's green for your child to get their veggies? And, you know, and it, it turns kids into this, like, I don't know, somehow they're, you know, horrible when they're just trying to, like, figure it out and get fed and not eat disgusting stuff, mm. which a lot of adult food tastes disgusting to children. And and parents who, you know, increasingly, even if you're not a helicopter parent, are just, you know, o- aware and very worried about kids getting proper nourishment. And I think that's where also you know, the supplement becomes such a, even my, even my house, my kids will get, my son will get up on the counter and they'll say, like, dad. Can we have a multivitamin? Because we haven't had one for like a week, you know, just in case. 
and you know, you'll hear me say like, oh, this, you know, multivitamin pro, but in the dad mode, I'm like, yeah, yes, yeah, sweetie, just in case. <laughs> and it's, it's a type of, I think, um, a type of thinking that forgets what we are. It forgets that we're like alpha predators, giant, giant cerebral containing creatures that like can live on cardboard for a week mm. and that we can extract all the nutrients from we need from a variety of sources because we have this massively big metabolically hungry brain. And so. Hey, if you like that video, you need to check out this one here and I'll see you there. On caffeine. Now I'm going to tell you the science on the, the cheapest way to wake up. It's called sunlight. Right, and so here's the deal, is when the sun hits your eye, there's a special cell in your eye called a melanopsin cell. When the blue light from the sun hits your eye, it turns that shit off, it turns off the melatonin, you wake up. So what I'd rather see people do is grab that water, because that's absolutely what you wanna do. Most people don't know sleep is a dehydrative event. Hmm. Um, you lose almost a full liter of water from the humidity in your breath. 